Hello, everybody, and welcome to Geopolitics in Conflict show. Very, very excited to be with you. I know I just got back from overseas here, so I'm still jet lagged. But because of my guest today, I kind of like, no, I'm going to wait for another 48 hours. I'm going to get on it right away. So, so I have a great guest with me today. I'm going to have a great conversation. And my guest is none other and the only one, Larry Johnson. For those who do not know who Larry Johnson is, Larry has an extensive background within the intelligence community. He worked for the CIA as an analyst. Then he worked in the State Department uh, for the Office of the Counterterrorism. Larry is also the co-owner and the CEO of the Burke Associate LRC. Burke stands for Business Exposure Reduction Group. So, so this is what I'm going to be having a conversation today with Larry. So welcome to geopolitics in conflict show larry thanks david good to be with you thanks all for the right. invite all right so well let's just get into it because i got a lot to cover and i don't want to waste much time here so i'd like to get your perspective as an analyst you know you were in washington you understand how the dynamics work as an analyst how do you see the u.s involvement regarding the uh, the israeli uh, hamas conflict today I see the U.S. is both confused and uncertain about what to do. And it's being drug along uh, by the events themselves. It's not, in, it's not setting, mm-hmm. setting the agenda. So uh, every, everyone, I think, was caught completely unaware by the attack uh, by Hamas on October 7th. Uh, it caught the Israelis by surprise, certainly caught the United States by surprise. Um, the initial reaction of Israel was in both a combination of anger and embarrassment, uh, and they and they just lashed out, and they ended up the Israeli in their counter strike. Mm-hmm. I, I think they could account for as much as fifty percent of the total deaths that occurred that day that are attributed solely to Hamas. You know, the the propaganda line is Hamas killed fourteen hundred, mm-hmm. then Israel. Revise that down to 1,200 uh, and indicate the other 200 were Hamas fighters. But uh, within that, I, I think it, it looks like uh, Israel may very well have killed three to 400 of its own people through just the sheer recklessness or um, what they call the Hannibal Directive. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they feel that uh, Israelis are being taken hostage, they'd rather kill them than have them subjected to the hostage situation. So throughout this, the United States falls back on, oh, we're going to support Israel. And then as the pressure increases uh, internationally as a result of Israel killing so many civilians, then the Biden administration starts uh, tap dancing. Uh, well, we're, we're also in favor of a two-state solution. And uh, you know they, they keep trying to find uh, a middle ground, and there is really no middle ground here, uh, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, I think the U.S. is just playing uh, lip service per se. I mean, I saw the uh, the uh, uh, call at the U.N. for ceasefire, and 14 countries objected to that, starting with yeah. the United States. What surprised me more, uh, Larry, is how we. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it really pains me to say this about my country, but we can't shy away from speaking the truth. It pains me to see how the United States administration, or government that is calls for this rule of law, calls for this uh, uh, human dignity and so forth. And when it comes down to calling out Israel for ceasefire, the Biden administration couldn't do it. In your opinion, do you think the administration is being pressured here? Oh, yeah. No, they're they're definitely under some pressure. But the primary pressure is coming from uh, the Jewish community, AIPAC, American Israeli Political Action Mm -hmm. Committee, Mm -hmm. to make sure that they are providing Israel with all the support that it needs. Uh, Unfortunately, the United States also is uh, finding that its traditional allies in the Middle East, Turkey, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt in particular, are coming to the United States and saying, you know, you need to get the Israelis to stop. This killing has got to stop. And the United States is sort of uh, stumbling in its response. The, the, The... hypocrisy, I guess, is the the thing that's bubbling to the surface. And that's why Malta, its resolution passed 
with the United States abstaining and uh, Russia abstaining in, in the Security Council. But I, I think you're going to see more actions coming from the UN that are going to increasingly isolate Israel and the United States. Mm -hmm. There was I did see a video earlier today of uh, Joseph Morrell being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And, and what he said highlights what the problem is, both with uh, Biden and, 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 and the policy of NATO towards what's happening in Israel. Uh, the interviewer asked him to Burrell, so uh, are, are the Israelis guilty of war crimes? And Burrell goes, oh, no, I, I'm not a lawyer. lawyer. I, geez, that, that's, how could I talk about I'm not a lawyer. And so then the interviewer followed up and says, well, it was the Hamas attack on October 7th a war crime. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was a war crime. Yeah. And then the interviewer goes, wait, wait, time out. You just uh -huh. said you weren't a lawyer and couldn't make an assessment about what was a war crime or not. Now you're saying it's a war crime? That is the problem encapsulated right there. This kind of hypocrisy where there's one standard with respect to Israel, another standard mm -hmm. with respect to the Palestinians. And uh, the, the rest of the world outside of the United States, outside of a few countries in Europe, is uh, is basically sick of it. They're pushing back. They're, they're not going to take it anymore. Yeah. yeah, it's because it really uh, highlights the double standard per se. Let alone the question yeah. that so, some of us Americans are asking. What is our interest in this fight to begin with? I mean, yeah. you look no, at no. yeah, you look at now the government allocating billions of dollars to Israel beside Ukraine, which we will talk about later. Uh, it, it, it just, uh, it, it, it begs the question, what is our yeah. interest into doing this? Yeah, th th that's what we've had trouble defining. Hmm. Really what we should be insisting upon is uh, Israel has a right to exist. The Palestinians have a right to exist. Indeed. The Palestinians need to have a state of their own that they are in control of where Israel is not you know, running rampant over their property and, and arresting them at will. Uh, that's ultimately where, where we need to be going. But this is, this is playing out in a much broader uh, strategic picture. The United States has this long-standing animus towards Iran, and mm -hmm. we're hell-bent on getting into a war with Iran. And, and some of it's at the behest of Israel. And, and the irony in that is, uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember that in the 1980s, the United States and Israel were happily selling weapons to the, quote, terrorist nation of Iran. Indeed. So th that's why I, 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 you know, I'm always saying, spare, spare me the uh, sanctimony uh, about how, how rigorous we are in combating terrorism and holding terrorists to account. Mm. We claim Iran is a terrorist state, and yet we were you know, happily selling them weapons. Weapons. And, you know, some of those weapons were used against actually U.S. personnel. I got a buddy of mine who was the uh, Navy SEAL commander of the Hercules Barge in the Persian mm. Gulf in 1987, and they had uh, Stinger missiles fired at them that Ali North um, got transferred to Iran. So, you know, it's just, uh, like I said, th this picture ends up being a lot more complicated mm -hmm then sort of the Israel's the good guys, Palestinians are the bad guys, and the United States needs to side with the good guys. Mm. It looks like, Larry, in my opinion, it looks like uh, uh, we dug a hole for ourselves that now it won't be easy for us to get out. And the reason yeah. I'm saying this, uh, just given as one who spent time in the Middle East back when I was in Washington at the time, and uh, uh, I'm seeing the, the, the changes within the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East. That is not to the U.S. favor. And apparently, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Larry here, apparently that the key players in the Middle East are shifting east towards China. At the yeah. same time, yeah. China and Russia are playing a far greater role in the Middle East than they did, let's say, two decades ago. Now, yeah, with this conflict, fact... yeah, with this conflict, Larry, do you think now this spells the end of the U.S. dominance in the Middle East. Uh, short answer, yes. You know, as, as we speak, mm. uh, the Turks, the Jordanians, the Saudis, the Egyptian foreign ministers are in Beijing meeting with the Chinese. And uh, 
uh, Wang Yi just uh, met with them and they were holding mm -hmm. hands and smiling and embracing. Uh, the, the Chinese were received the, the, the Arab Muslim representatives of the Islamic Conference in a very warm manner. And China clearly will want to try to increase its influence uh, in the Middle East. But, you know, the United States plan, policy over the last 30, 40 years mm -hmm. has always been one of divide and conquer. So, for example, uh, we worked with the United Kingdom and with Turkey to try to destroy Bashar Assad and his Syrian government, provided in the course of that uh, weapons, training to Islamic extremists, the very ones that we claimed we were fighting in the global war on terror. Um, we were involved in the war in Yemen between uh, the Houthis and the, and, and the government in Sana'a uh, as a device to split Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia and Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, we got uh, Syria driven out of the Arab League. So uh, we were happy to keep all of these uh, uh, sides warring with each other. And then as a result of the United States special you know, reaction to the Russian special military operation and the sanctions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all of a sudden we push Russia and China together. China then starts uh, uh, wielding its influence. It settles the war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which stops immediately the war in Yemen. So all of a sudden now, where the uh, Iranians and uh, the Saudis were enemies, now they're collaborating and they're meeting regularly. So, you know, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago on a Saturday, you had this Islamic conference in Saudi Arabia initially, and there was uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman standing side by side with a uh, Raisi of Iran. All right. And so uh, they were, you know, shaking hands, collaborating. Same thing between Turkey's Erdogan and Bashar al-Assad, uh, who have been at loggerheads with Turkey, again, at for a while trying to overthrow Assad, there they were interacting. So the U.S. policy has really collapsed. And the, what the United States could count on before with going to countries like Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, mm. Egypt, and Turkey to intervene, to do sort of carry water for us in these conflicts that Israel would have uh, with uh, either Hezbollah or Hamas, uh, that door is basically closed. You saw what happened when... and. Tony Blinken uh, went to meet with them, and they, oh, yeah. you know, they basically they said no, we're not going to do that. But they did go to a press conference with him, so they could beat him up publicly at the press conference. Then when Blinken showed up in Turkey, he gets off the plane, and normally they'd send out like the foreign minister. Now nah, they sent they sent the deputy mayor from the nearest town out there to greet him. I mean, it was uh, nobody. Wow. So. The U.S. influence is definitely coming to an end. Yeah. And it's because, well, actually, I, I agree with you, Larry, especially as one who works in Washington. And when I used to sometimes write reports, whatever, like uh, I give the example here just to share it with our viewers uh, for the invasion of Iraq. And I argued against it because I said, you guys have no idea what are you getting into. You're going to yeah. change the dynamics in the Middle East far beyond your beliefs. And I was like told, oh, Mr. O, it's going to be a, a quick walk. We go in, liberate Baghdad, and everything will be fine. I said, if you go in, you are in there for about 15 to 20 years. And Iraq will never be the same. And Iran will flex its military and economic muscles. And you won't be able to control the way you used to anymore. And this is exactly what we are seeing right now. Uh, yeah, now, yeah. speaking of Iran, you mentioned Iran earlier. Uh, I'd like to take your in or like to have your input rather, Larry, about what 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 do you think in your opinion that prevents both Israel and the United States from attacking Iran? We hear the bravado about oh Israel is gonna conduct an attack against Iran, the US will attack uh, uh, Iran, but none of them were able to do it. Well, it, there's a difference between launching one attack. Mm -hmm. that would then, you know, kill some Iranians, damage some territory, but it's certainly not going to destroy Iran by any stretch. You know, the, the, the only way the United States could hope to, quote, destroy Iran would be to launch a massive nuclear strike at it. 
And if it does that, it's going to be in a nuclear war with Russia and China in a heartbeat. So, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, it, it, it's just it's a difficult military task. Hmm. Iran is four times the size of Iraq. Okay. And you look at how much trouble the United States had trying to quell Iraq with, you know, we had 300,000 troops, 400,000 there. I couldn't do it. Um, the logistics line required to refuel ships or planes makes it, you know, quite lengthy. Mm-hmm. And any of the U.S. ships that get into the Persian Gulf are going to be vulnerable to attack from Iran's uh, land to uh, ship missiles uh, that they can, you know, start sinking some aircraft carriers. So there is no, you know, one golpe, you know, one strike that's going to uh, take out Iran. And, you know, this is the United States has got the we, we like to talk tough. Yeah. We like to talk in a very threatening manner. But we don't have the ability to actually deliver on those threats. And my attitude is, you know, don't don't threaten somebody that you're going to, you know, beat them up, yeah. toss them out. If you have no intention of beating them up and tossing them out, uh, because all you're doing is you're raising the expectations or raising the tensions. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iran has, a, you know, they have the ability to do uh, to push back, but. Iran, Iraq, Turkey, they're all confused by us, by the United States. Yeah, as you mentioned, the uh, the invasion in 2003 of Iraq. So at the time, Iraq, which is a majority Shia population, is controlled by the Ba'athist party, which are basically Sunni Muslims. Okay? Right. Sunni Muslims have been the enemy of Iranians, the Persians, and Iran. So we're okay. That's how the world sees it. Yeah. So the United States plan is we're going to invade Iraq. We're going to get rid of the Sunnis who have been the main enemy of Iran. We're going to install a government of people that have been backed by Iran. And at the same time, though, we're going to say we got to get rid of Iran. (laughs) Now, if you're the Iranians, you're sitting there going, uh... Well, thank God for the Americans. You know, they're get, we couldn't get rid of Saddam. You know, we tried. We went to war, lost millions trying to get rid of Saddam, and the Americans did it for us. Oh, thank you, America. All right. But then all of a sudden, America is now recognizing the Mujahideen al Khalq, which was a, which is a terrorist organization, uh, and has engaged in terrorist attacks. Now the United States is recognizing them and funding them in hopes that they'll carry out terrorist attacks against Iran. But the United States is strongly against terrorism. See, you know, frankly, it's just this bullshit piles up to a point that the rest of the world goes, all right, we can't stand it anymore. These Americans, they don't listen to themselves. They lie to themselves. They lie to us. And they act in a very counterproductive manner. What? They're not reliable. We'll deal with somebody else. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, Larry. And this is one thing that most American uh, people have no understanding of because what we say versus what we do are on the opposite right. end of the spectrum. It just, uh, <clears throat> let alone, it shatters our credibility beyond repair. So I want to go uh, quickly to one point about uh, Iran and China and Russia in the Middle East. I wrote a book mm-hmm. about Iran a few years ago. And I argued back then that I won't be surprised in a matter of time and given the shifting, the inevitable shifting of the global geopolitical landscape in the Middle East, that we might see some sort of uh, 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 an alliance, a rapprochement, a partnership, if you will, between Iran, Russia, and China. And yeah. this is exactly what we're seeing. What I argued yeah. back then, Larry, and correct me if I'm if I was wrong in my analysis here, that I said I wrote back then, it will be just a matter of time before the possibility of Iran allowing either a naval presence of China or Russia or both in its country. Will I be uh, out of line if I say something like this? That the possibility of it could happen. Well, they've already been conducting. Milita- joint military mm-hmm. exercises for four years, going back to 2017 is when the planning process on this started. Uh, so uh, 
you know, and they're doing it ever they're doing it regularly, both uh, ground-based uh, joint uh, exercises as well as uh, naval exercises. So, uh, I, I think Russia and China both recognize that they're they have strategic reasons. You know, for China in particular, from the standpoint of you know, having another reliable source of oil that it can depend on uh, coming out of Iran. But, uh, you know, the, the Iran now has Russia and China in its camp standing beside it, which makes it a much more formidable uh, mm -hmm. foe if the United States chooses to try to go to war with it. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah, a lot of people do not know that uh, during the talks about the negotiations, rather, uh, of the P5 plus one uh, and Iran regarding the Iran nuclear deal, the GCPUA, it was Russia and China that have convinced Iran to agree to the terms because mm -hmm. they both understood that they're going to get something in return moving forward. And of course, we changed the horses in the middle of the race <laughs> by withdrawing unilaterally. Which was we all know that's uh, that's not a good way of uh, conducting business per se. So, 